So my friends, batteries are now finally making advancements after years of being stagnant. We have range monsters now like Mercedes' EQXX concept that in reality actually did over a thousand kilometers on a single charge and could have done more. We have cars that we know better like Porsche's Taycan that just from Gen 1 to Gen 2 has apparently increased its range by almost 30% going from 200 miles to well over 300 in this new generation. Now, while that's great for EVs, we are all not that enamored with EVs at the moment, particularly in 2024 with the market crashing around them. But the benefit of all this advancement is to hybrids, like our car today. This is the Mercedes E-Class, which is in every version available in some form a hybrid, either a mild hybrid or like we have today with our E300e, a full plug-in hybrid with a decent sized battery and up to 70 miles of actual range. This is a huge improvement compared to the last generation of hybrids that were giving 10, 20, maybe 30 miles of electric range. And the benefits must be obvious to us. You use those electric miles for your urban jobs, your jobs around your house, around your work. And then when you need your trusty combustion engine to pull you along on longer trips, it's there and it's your familiar old friend. Now, the great thing about the E-Class is A, that it's got that great range, but in terms of actually being a proper Mercedes-Benz, it's probably their one new model that I sat in and I looked at in terms of design and thought, this is a properly built Mercedes. And I wanna kind of convey that element to you today. So today we're gonna to check out every detail of the E300e, and then we're gonna go for a drive. So let's check it out. One thing you'll always see on RBR videos that is on point is my beard. And that's all thanks to Manscaped who've been sponsoring RBR videos for years. These two battered units here are what I take with me everywhere, whether I'm traveling on press trips. And I'm of course talking about the Beard Hedger Pro and the Handyman. And both of these together are an unbeatable tag team in keeping our beards looking as sharp as possible all the time. And our spring cleaning fever is upon us and I wanna to talk to you about why I love these so much. First of all, the Beard Hedger Pro. This thing is incredible. It's got 20 settings within the zoom dial here that you can choose different lengths and it's super accurate. My beard is exactly the same every single time that I style it. And the reason why it manages it every time, it's got a titanium coated stainless steel T-blade in here that does all the cutting work perfectly. The other great thing about both of them is that they are USB-C, so easy to charge. This beard hedger has 60 hours worth of battery life and it's got a three light LED indicator to show you when the battery's low and when you need to charge it, which is always so useful. And the great thing is it's waterproof as well. I absolutely swear by this. Then we have the Handyman, which again, USB-C, LED indicator. This has got two blades in it. We've got your typical foil shaver blade as well as the long hair leveler blade. And the great thing about this, it gets as close as possible to give that really completely smooth and clean finish. And this is also waterproof and has 60 minutes of runtime. And like I said, for that three day shadow, it's brilliant. It's small, compact, perfect for me when I'm traveling on press trips, etc. Again, USB-C. These two together, like I said, an unbeatable tag team. And thanks to our spring event, you guys get a fantastic discount. Use the code RBR on manscaped.com and you will get a straight 20% off and free international shipping. So that's RBR on manscaped.com. Join me in keeping your beards as sharp as possible. Huge thanks to Manscaped, and now back to the episode. So guys, if we presuppose that the modern era of Mercedes cars started with the new S-Class, as I think it should, then this new E-Class is the first car I've driven since then, and including that car, that I've thought this is a proper Mercedes, both in terms of its design, both inside and outside, and the way it's put together. And it just gave me that feeling of quality that I expect from that star. And thank goodness for that, because the E-Class is relied upon by millions ever since it was introduced way back in the 1920s, if you want to go that far back with the mid-size original Mercedes saloon. So I'm glad that that is the case. And I think a lot of that is attributable to the design of this car. That is, it's just different to the C-Class and the S-Class enough. And I always like the fact that the E-Class has always come in with something a little bit quirky in their design, particularly in the modern era, whether it was twin lights, whether it was bulbous lights, whether it was lights connected to 
a grill with an illuminated grill like we have here today, it needs to stand out from the rest of the Mercedes crowd. And this one really does. Now the price of new cars is increasing and this is something that we're gonna talk about in a video very soon. So the new E-Class in the UK starts at 55,000 pounds with the E200 AMG line. The car we have today is the E300e hybrid. So this is a proper plug-in hybrid. As we said, has both a combustion engine, so a two liter four cylinder engine in the front. And then we have our hybrid system, which consists of a permanently synchronous electric motor, which is linked to a 25.4 kilowatt battery. This means that we have part combustion power and we have part electric power combining to give us 313 brake horsepower in this car and a zero to 60 of around about 6.4 seconds. Now I do like the naming convention because given the horsepower on offer, I think E300 is the right way to name this. That is what I think an E300 would have in the past. Now the more interesting figure that comes out of this hybrid system is the electrical range, which is up to 70 miles in the summer. And at the moment in the dead of the winter, I'm getting 55 miles. And as you guys know, batteries perform better in the summer, which means we're gonna get very close to that 70 mile range, which is great. I'm gonna do a road trip in between this video and I'll give you the actual range figures that I got from both electric and combined driving, which is really actually fascinating. So stay tuned for that. Now as for the rest of the tech, all of the power goes to the rear wheels. This is a rear wheel driven car, it's not formatic, and we have indeed the nine speed automatic that we are used to. Now as for the plug-in hybrids, they come standard with the agility control suspension, which is a steel based coil suspension system, but it does have adaptive damping. I thought that this would end up being quite uncomfortable because in other territories, you get the technology package with ADS plus and full airmatic all around, which I have experienced in my previous drives. Do check those out if you haven't yet, I drove the 450 and I drove the all-terrain. But this actually, the standard suspension, the plugins, was very, very good. So I'm excited to show you just how comfortable it is later in the review. The other thing you get in the technology package in other countries is 4.5 degree rear wheel steering. And again, that's something that I did not really miss in this. And we'll talk about that later. And the final figure that you need to know about is the weight, which is 2.2 tons, which actually isn't bad for a luxury plug-in hybrid. Now, like I said, the other thing that I really liked about this car was the design. I like the fact that it's got a unique design versus S-Class. I like the fact that it's got a unique design versus the C-Class. And the other great thing that even in the UK now, we can have the classic grill in the exclusive version of this car, which is actually the most expensive. It comes with the classic grill, the Mercedes star on the hood, and the biggest wheels you can get are 21 inches. And the best interior that you can get with diamond quilted stitching and Nappa leather. And this is kind of a great alternative to S-Class. And you'll see why, once I finish driving it, why I think that. But generally, I just think the E-Class is a better looking car inside and out. So bear that in your mind while you're watching the rest of this video. But the design I really like. I thought I would hate it because it looks like the EQ cars that I generally hate. But it just works so well on a traditional cab backward design Mercedes-Benz. The more I've looked at the new C-Class, the more I think the proportions of that car are just wrong. The bonnet's too long, the boot's too short. When I look at the E-Class, I think the proportions are perfect for a Mercedes saloon. I love the way you still have the power domes in the front bonnet. I love the way that the front just looks unique with those rounded lights. They almost look like upside down versions of what we got in the 2 on 2 uh, facelift generation, which is cool. And then we have the rear lights, which I think were Marmite to some people when they first came out. Whenever I see these on the road, whenever I see this car parked and the Mercedes stars come to life within that rear bar, it just looks quality. And I've shown you guys the E-Class now in so many different specifications and it just looks great in every single one. I've not seen a badly spec E-Class ever. And this is as simple as it gets in high-tech silver with silver wheels. But it's a really nicely designed car. In this version that we have today, which is the UK's premium plus car, you get the lighted grille as well. You get digital light, which projects images onto the road while you're driving, which I will show you later. And it gives you the welcome lights as you turn the car on, as I've shown you in the past with AMG cars. Now, of course, there is one other hybrid that's sitting at the top, and that is the E53 AMG. And you would have seen that on the channel if you haven't, there's the link. And again, this is a car that has about 70 miles of electric range with a really powerful inline six, yay, cylinder engine sitting under the hood rather than a four cylinder, making up two 612 brake horsepower on race start and a proper AMG body with wide front arches and 
all the works to sit right at the top. And again, AMG design language actually translated really well into the E-Class, um, even with that kind of zany new front end and even with the lighted grill. So yeah, really nice. Now guys, let's go inside. I'm gonna talk a little bit about practicality, but mainly I wanna fill you in on how useful the battery has been versus having an EV, because I've lived with a Taycan twice for around about 50,000 miles total. So I know what it's like to live with a good EV. I wanna to impart to you what it's like to live with a great hybrid car. So guys, the first thing I checked when I jumped in this e-hybrid was the range. This was what I was most interested in because what pulls me toward this car is that when you compare it price-wise to an equivalent EV in any other manufacturer or at Mercedes-Benz, it's around about the same price as the entry-level ones. For example, the EQE 300, it's around about 70,000 pounds, which is the same price as this, but this is so much better looking outside. It's so much better looking inside and it has use of a combustion engine when you need it. So what I really wanted was for the electric side of it to also be good. So that's great. On one side, you've got 54 miles worth of electric range. Fantastic. Which will probably translate closer to 70, as we said, in the summer. But then you look at the combustion side, it's a rather disappointing 320 odd miles. And you're thinking four cylinder engine, is it the heavy car or what's going on? So what I did was I said, look, these figures are never accurate. What we need to do is do a proper drive in this thing. So what I did was I drove from where I am to Manchester, which is in the Midlands, middle of the UK. It's around about 195 miles. And this is gonna give us a good idea of what this car can actually do in reality. So guys, a little update on the trip so far. I've done around about 60 to 70 miles of the trip on hybrid mode only. As we said, we're gonna leave it in hybrid. The petrol range is almost unmoved at 311 miles. But worryingly, hybrid mode seems to mean that it's gonna be using as much of the battery as possible. So now I've got, in terms of the battery at least, range anxiety because we're under three quarters in now. So I'm wondering, shouldn't it be really using the hybrid mode to use both equally so you get the best miles per gallon? I don't know. Your next update is going to be as we arrive. Let's see what happens with our mileage, etc. when we arrive at our destination. Now, interestingly, as time went on during that trip, we could see that the combustion mileage was actually increasing quite significantly. And weirdly, even though I was in hybrid mode and I was using the route based version, which uses the navigation and tries to use apparently both sides of your drivetrain, not just one. All it was doing was draining the battery, waiting for it to go to zero before eventually using the combustion engine. So guys, we have arrived at the destination and the results are pretty amazing. Check this out. Our range is actually almost identical to the range we had on the combustion side for when we left 195 miles ago. And of course our battery is empty, but that means we had well over a hundred plus more miles in the combustion range than the car was telling us. And this is why we do long-term tests so you actually get the reality. So there you go. The actual mileage and the range way better than what we thought it would be. And our total miles per gallon, 58.6. So guys, here's a predicament that you would have heard with EVs. It also exists with hybrids and that is the cost of charging when you're away from home. We've got a small 25-ish kilowatt battery in the E-Class. You'd think, yeah, that's all right. Not difficult to charge up. BP Pulse here is charging 77 pence per kilowatt, which means me filling this thing up will cost me a whopping 20 pounds for just 50 miles of charge. There's literally no point in me doing this. I might as well put 20 pound more of petrol in and I'll get half decent range out of it. And this is the problem generally, even with hybrids, that if you're not at home, you're just gonna get completely ripped off. So no, I'm not gonna charge you. I'm gonna move this car into the normal car park. Shame. So significantly more combustion miles than we thought we were gonna get. Way, way more. And in fact, when I returned from that trip here, I still had over 190 miles worth of range. And even today, when I'm just about to go on this drive with you, I've got about 78 miles. I've not put a single penny into the fuel tank yet. 
okay? And I've just been using the car for five days doing all the odds and ends, the school runs, the grocery trips, etc., purely on that 50 odd mile of electric range. So this is really proving the concept for me. When it was the long drive that I had to go on, the car was able to do it. Even if it messed up the whole hybrid side of things, it still did that drive on a really good MPG level. And then when it comes to in-town stuff, all I'm doing is using the EV mode. So this is great. Now I'm gonna to impart to you how the car drives. Before that, let me show you this interior, which like I said earlier, I think it's the best put together new Mercedes interior that they've done in this new generation. So guys, I absolutely love the interior of the new E-Class. Even though it's got one of the things I hate most in the EQ cars, which is the huge screen thing that they call, in the EQ cars, hyperscreen, in this car, it's actually different. It's called a super screen because it's not one screen that links into the driver's zone. The driver's zone screen, as you can see, is a completely separate unit, which is much better. And it's actually, you know, a lot sportier. And in fact, it's got a surprise that I'll show you in a second. But the super screen itself is narrower. It sits much lower in the dash, so it doesn't overpower you. It's got this gorgeous vent design that goes all around it, finished in a lovely metal finish alongside the active amb ambient lighting within here as well. And it's just so well done. The vents as well are digital as well as manual. So for example, if we go into climate, we can go into here and choose upper body, for example, and you'll see the vents move themselves. Go to head, and if we put that back down, It'll start moving again and again you don't need to use that you can actually do it manually as well but there's motors within there but i don't care about that i actually like the fact that the dashboard is really well made look it's napa leather it's got your selfie cam in there which again i'm not really bothered about i like the touchy feel it just feels really well put together you've got this massive center console here in the middle which is trimmed in this lovely wood finish with a metal inlay but then you've got the ambient lighting that goes all around it it feels solid. Touchscreen wipe as you need in these cars because it's an inevitability. Good thing that Mercedes gives that to you. You've got your phone charger in there, some very clever cup holders as well. But more than that, it's just, it's just put really well together. When you look at this driver's own section in its isolation, it just looks so gorgeous, be it daytime or even more at night where I know Mercedes do go OTT sometimes on their ambient lighting, but in the E-Class, particularly this top flowing light bar is beautiful. And in this car, we've got something called active ambient lighting. And all of this, you can decide whether you want to use it or not. For example, sound visualization, it will pulsate with the music that's playing in the car, which is really cool. If you're getting too close to a car ahead, if you open your door and there's a car coming, it'll flash red, etc. All of that is useful, but you can turn it off if you don't want it. And things like climate as well. For example, if we knock up the climate control, you can look at that. That's, how good is that? So you don't need to use that if you don't want to, but it's a cool visualization. It's using the light bars as kind of the soul of the car, telling you what's going on. I really like the fact that the driver's zone is separate. And the cool thing about the driver's zone just like the S-Class, it's in 3D. Now, I can't show you what that looks like via my camera, but I'll try to explain it. For example, our round dials here sit much closer to me, whereas the background kind of fades into the back and the text is much farther forward as well. And then it moves slightly when I turn my head, kind of like you had in the Nintendo 3DS back in the day. That's the best way to describe it. But it is literally the best digital screen I've ever used. Because of this, it kind of feels like an analog screen rather than digital one. Nothing is as good once you've experienced this. Every other digital screen just feels cheap. And the other amazing thing, again, that I can't show you, sadly, you have to experience it, is the Burmeister 4D sound. So it's the upgraded option. Why is it 4D? First of all, you've got Dolby Atmos, which if you've experienced it, it's kind of like the first time you experience in in-ear headphones. It changes your music. It's like the first time you're listening your favorite track. That I can't show you, but I'm sure you appreciate the value of that. The second thing, and the reason it's called 4D, is that, again, you can choose this, but the seats will vibrate to the sound of the music. This car that we have today doesn't have massage seats, but if you've got the music on, you almost get a semi-massage from the vibration of the music and the 4D sound. So that's a really, really cool part of the Premium Plus pack. Now, the other thing we have up here is the selfie cam, which, I don't really get the point of it, but 
if you really want to take a selfie, you can. The reason that Mercedes were touting the camera was that you can get apps for video calling on this. So you can have your Teams meeting, etc., while you're in the e-class. The nice thing is as a hybrid mode, you get lots of readouts here and it tells you exactly what's going on inside the system while you're driving. And we will check that out as we're on the road as well. Now, the other great thing that's been upgraded is their already great voice assistant, which is now, if you're alone in the car, always listening to you. Change the ambient lighting to yellow. Yellow, sunny and bright. So as you can see, it's always listening and you don't need to use the old Hey Mercedes command that you used to have to do in the past. So it's gone smarter. Now, the cool thing is that most of these things aren't even available in the S class. So a lot of these things only benefiting you in E class, which is endearing me even more to this car because I just prefer the interior as well as you know. Right guys, now we've got enough electric range and enough combustion to do this drive. Let me impart to you what I thought this car was like. I'm going to do that by starting off in electric mode, which as you can see, is completely silent. I think my favorite thing in terms of using electric mode has been using it in those scenarios where you probably waste the most of your traditional fuel. Things like your school run in the morning that I've been solely using electric mode for. I'll get up in the morning, I'll have your, the 50 mile odd range. I'll do both school trips, come back home and by then I'll still have 40 odd miles left. And I know with my combustion cars how much fuel I waste normally just doing the school runs. In the last few months, I've only been doing it in the M2 until this car turned up. And honestly, it is a cost saver and it is a lifesaver. And it's not just been school runs. Now, when you have that 40 mile odd range left, if you commute to work, for most of us, that's going to be enough to get to work and probably charge up again. And it's not a large battery. You can have it fully charged within two hours. So. This is all really making sense to me when it comes to urban stuff, when it comes to stuff near your home, that the battery has enough range to kind of satiate what you need it to do. And when it doesn't have enough range, well, you just knock the car into a different driving mode like sport or hybrid, and the combustion engine is on. Now, the downside to that is the combustion engine itself. This is a four cylinder, two liter engine that sounds really strained all the time. It sounds like a raggedy old diesel engine. Maybe not that bad, but it just sounds like it's being strangled and it's really struggling. And this is nothing like the beautiful, beautiful 450 in line six version of the E-Class that I drove last time on the channel, which was so beautifully refined, so powerful, and it even had the nice sound experience of the fake six cylinder sound inside the cabin which you could turn off, but a really nice engine. This four cylinder isn't like that. You're almost like you want to use the electric power or the, du the dual hybrid mode more than ever having to just use the combustion engine. You're kind of dreading using the combustion engine. Actually, while we drive, I think I'm gonna change the ambient lighting to this one, which is my favorite. Um, that's much better. I, I love how they've done the ambient lighting in this car. It's, there is a lot of it and you can turn it all down at night if you really want to, but it is very eventful. And if you like it like I do, you can bump it up and it's exciting during the day as well. Personally at night, I absolutely love it. I love how it highlights the best parts of the interior structure. I love how when you change the color, it's almost like you change the stitching on the interior and it all becomes a little bit different. Now, the good thing is even though the engine does sound strained, thanks to the fact that this is a proper full plug-in hybrid, as we can see here, when we look at the energy flow of the vehicle, it is using both our electric motor and our combustion engine when it comes to delivering power to us. So you never have any lag. Just because it's a small four cylinder doesn't mean it's laggy. It is providing you immediate power all the time. And it feels, to be honest, commensurately fast in that way as well. As you can see, the dials and the readouts here that they have are fantastic. They're really, really good and really useful to watch because as I like to see, particularly as a car reviewer, I like to know, let's say if we're in hybrid mode, exactly which part of the system is giving me power and these readouts are really useful. So whether you're in electric mode, which I think is actually the ideal mode in this car as a luxury car, or whether you're in hybrid or whether you're in sport, you've got a zero lag response from a really, really good drivetrain. You've got great range, great miles per gallon, whether it's a long trip or whether you're doing your stuff locally, it's just a big win-win. And for me versus an EV, you haven't got the range anxiety. 
even if you wind up in that position like I did where the charging infrastructure sucks and they're literally conning us out of money, you don't have to charge up like you would do in an EV. You can just rely on your trusty combustion engine. So that's all great. The drivetrain element is better than an EV and it's better than solely using a combustion car. As far as having a luxury car goes, it's just superior. Then we come to the actual refinement of this car, which I thought not having the air springs was going to really leave it hindered versus the versions that I tried previously, but this car is so well sorted. It is so, so comfortable. It genuinely feels on S-Class level, and this is just the standard agility control spring coil base system that you get in the plug-in hybrids. It sits a little bit higher. You've got you know a bit more weight of the hybrid. I think all of that helping the refinement. It's just gliding across even some of these horrible, horrible roads that we have in the Bucks area where I live. Um, it has been effortless, whether it's been in and around town, crashing through puddles, in the rain, on a long motorway trip, it has been exemplary when it comes to luxury. It's super comfortable. I'm not missing the rear wheel steer. If anything, rear wheel steer often feels weird to me. We're in this, it just feels quite natural, uh, the handling of the car. Yes, it's heavy. Yes, this is not a sports car by any sense of the word. And at 76,000 pounds, that might be irking you a little bit, but I'm not looking at it as a sports car. I'm looking at it as an alternative to an S-Class that isn't as big as that car, that is giving us nice ride, nice refinement, and I think a better interior than that car has, plus the luxury of having both the combustion and the electric range. The one downside on the electric side of this car, if we shift into, which I hate using the stupid dynamic button down here, it is awful. I wish that even the normal Mercedes cars had a better switch like the AMGs do. Anyway, that's a moan for another day. In electric mode, I wish like the AMGs that it had the sounds that the EQ cars have. I think it would just make sense. You've got everything else going for it. For example, I can use the paddles in electric or hybrid mode and it will control the recuperation in D minus. So you're almost on one pedal driving. I can go into D, which has your normal recuperation or go into plus where the car will just coast. And it's so cool that that automatically switches when I'm in electric or hybrid mode to use the paddles for that. Whereas if I go into sport, now I'm controlling the gears in manual mode. So very well done. I just wish that the electric sound element was in there as well. Technology like digital light has been great as well. For example, if I'm coming out of my lane by accident, then you'll get a marker on the floor. If I'm getting too close to the car in front, it'll display um, light signs on the floor as well, which is amazing. Um, and again, it just helps the experience of driving this car. Guys, I'm absolutely enamored with this, particularly versus an EV, because I think even 10 years from now, if this car suits my routine and my lifestyle today, it will suit my routine and my lifestyle 10 years from now, unlike an EV where, you know, the range can be so much better in those, like they're okay now. Whereas this car, you know, it's doing 500 plus miles as it stands. The only downside to this particular car for me has been the four cylinder engine that I just think is awful in the way it sounds. And if you're in the rest of the world, please get the six cylinder petrol. It is superior. So guys, I absolutely love this new generation of hybrids from Mercedes-Benz. Decent electric miles, great refinement, and in the E-Class, a properly built Mercedes, both inside and designed outside. I think the hybrid is now going to rain going forward, and this E-Class is, is one of the best out there right now. If you've enjoyed this episode of RBR, if you want to see more on hybrids, please like and share this video. So please, as always, do like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.